Let's pray. God, thank you for the truths that we get to remember and sing of this Christmas season. And I pray that even now as we turn our attention to open up your word again, that you would enable us to do just that, that we would adore and worship your son, Jesus. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Well, Merry Christmas. It is uh, wonderful to be together. I am so thankful that Christmas Day this year lands on the Lord's Day. And let me just commend you for actually being here this morning. Um, It's almost like you don't have anything better to do on a Sunday than to gather with God's people. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's right. Um, So that's just a demonstration of God's grace at work in, in you, church, and just thankful to the Lord for your commitment to this church and to gathering corporately together, uh, to enjoying and loving to do that, to hearing the preaching of God's word and spurring each other on every time that we get to be together. Uh, That is tremendous evidence of God's grace at work in you. Uh, And this Christmas, you know, as we gather together, really what we want to do is remember and worship. We're just saying about that, to adore him. Uh, We want to remember Jesus. We want to worship Jesus. And particularly on the Christmas season, we remember a baby. We remember a baby uh, born in obscurity into incredibly humbling and lowly circumstances over 7,000 miles away from where we are and over 2,000, almost 2,000 years ago. Uh, We remember this baby. But even as we remember a baby, we do not today worship a baby. We don't worship a baby. Jesus is not still a baby. He is a man. And not just any man. He is a man, the man who is God. And this God man that we worship is the king. Uh, Do you remember what we read in in scripture reading in Luke chapter 1? You can go, go there in your Bibles for a moment. This God man is the king. Luke recorded in chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, that he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. The son of the most high, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, He will reign. There will be no end to his kingdom. This language is clearly descriptive of a king. And so that's what we remember. We celebrate this morning is really the enthronement uh, of Jesus. God's determination to do this with his son. Arthur Pink, in his Attributes of God, says, Men will allow God to be everywhere except on his throne. They will allow him to be in his workshop to fashion worlds and make stars. They will allow him to be in his almondry to dispense his alms and bestow his bounties. They will allow him to sustain the earth and bear up the pillars thereof or light the lamps to heaven or rule the waves of the ever moving ocean. But when God ascends his throne, his creatures then gnash their teeth. But it is God upon his throne that we love to preach. It is God upon his throne whom we trust. Again, he says, there is nothing for which the children of God ought more earnestly to contend than the doctrine of their master over all creation. 
the kingship of God over all the works of his hands, the throne of God, and his right to sit upon that throne. And if your heart aches to see God enthroned this morning, then Psalm 2 will be a great encouragement to you. So turn your Bibles, please, with me to Psalm number 2. Here we will be reminded of the truth concerning King Jesus. Psalm number two. Let me read our passage for us from the Legacy Standard Bible. Why do the nations rage and the peoples meditate on a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. So now, O kings, show insight. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. In this psalm, what we encounter is the resolve of ungodly rebels concerning God's authority, as well as the resolve of God concerning Christ's rule. Rebels are determined to free themselves from God's authority, but God is is determined to establish his king over them. And in this description, what we have for this morning are four notable truths about this king that would do that it would do us well to remember this Christmas. Four notable truths about this king, Jesus. And first, we want to note his impotent enemies. His impotent enemies, verses 1 through 3, show us the impotence of all the enemies of God and his king. Just notice in these verses, there's a case made in favor of, of these rebels success there's a case made for their success look just look at what's described in verse 1 why do the nations rage and the peoples meditate on a vain thing this is not focusing on any one individual or any one person or even any one place these What's described here, these people are vast and they are many. They are nations. They are peoples. If nations and peoples were gathered against you, what effect would that have on you? These are vast and they're many. Just notice the plural nations, multiple nations, peoples, multiple peoples. Even in verse 2, note the greatness of the people, particularly in view, the kings 
of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together. There again, in the plural, multiple kings, multiple rulers. They are even great in their status. And they have this, I suppose, to their, in their favor, their resolve. Verse 3, they are resolved to tear their fetters apart or cast away their cords from us. That's a description of their intent, their resolve to no longer be under the authority, the sovereign rule of Yahweh and his anointed, his chosen one. Even with all of those things in their favor on their side, there is also evidence displayed proving their defeat. Their vastness, their number, their status, their resolve, even their taking counsel together, their meticulousness in being careful about how to accomplish their intended goal, these things benefit them not at all. There's evidence displayed proving their defeat. Just notice the question. The very first word, why? Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot a vain thing? Implicit in the question is the absurdity of what they're intending. Parents, have you ever done this to your children? You you see your children do something just so foolish that when you see it happen, you just go, why? Why? What reason under heaven could there be for you doing such a thing? That's the idea here. Why? This is ridiculous. This is absurd. It is foolish beyond all reason. And just notice the interpretation of what they're doing. The psalmist in the second line in verse 1 calls it what? Vain. It is vain, useless, to no avail. Here we see the truth of Proverbs 21.30. No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against Yahweh. It is useless to take your stand against him. And that is good for us to remember this morning. Christian, do you remember when you were on your vain way against God? When you refused to submit to his authority? You remember how useless that was? The kind of trouble that that welcomed into your life? Do you remember when God finally opened your eyes? And you thought, how foolish I have been. Why? Life is so much better under his reign. I have made a mess of my life. I want his authority. That's better by far than my own autonomy. And if you are still on that path, if you still refuse to submit to him, Perhaps you're a child here today, and that looks like a refusal to submit to God by obeying and honoring your parents. That is to take your stand against God, to reject his wisdom and parental authority, children. And for the rest of us, perhaps that has a different manifestation for you. If you have refused to entrust yourself to Christ, And the wise way that God says that there is for you to live under his authority, he gives you commands. He gives you instruction. He calls out to you in wisdom all day long. And you, sinner, refuse to bring yourself willingly under his yoke. That is a vain pursuit. To insist on such folly as this passage will show us has dire consequences. The further evidence proving their defeat is simply the opposition. Look at verse two. 
who who they've opposed, who they've taken their stand against Yahweh and against his anointed. Just two people in view, two persons, Yahweh, the self-existent covenant-keeping God of Israel, and his specially chosen king. And just notice, two against a multitude, and they do not have the advantage. The multitude, the nations, do not have the advantage. This is enough. His response, when all the nations, all the peoples, their kings, their rulers are gathered against him, all of the power they can muster, all of the wisdom they can muster against him and against his anointed, verse 4 shows his response. He, the one who sits in the heavens, laughs. He mocks them. This is laughable. And so in this, number two, this second notable truth that we see about this king is his implicit power. His implicit power demonstrated uh, in first Yahweh's confidence in this king. Yahweh's confidence in his king proves his implicit power. Verse four, Yahweh, the, he is the one referenced, the Lord who sits in the heavens. He laughs, he mocks them. Again, Arthur Pink says, were all the denizens of heaven and all the inhabitants of the earth to combine in revolt against him, it would occasion him no uneasiness and would have less effect upon his eternal and unassailable throne than has the spray of the Mediterranean's waves upon the towering rocks of Gibraltar. They do not affect him whatsoever. And so what does he do? Verse 5, in his mockery, he then speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his fury. And this is what he says, verse 6. This is in direct opposition to what they have set out to do, to what they have said in their hearts and to one another. He says this. As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy hill. The idea here is that the kings of the earth, the rulers, the mighty men who refuse to submit to God, God has a different determination. He possesses a similar resolve, but in the opposite direction. They are intent to not be under his rule. He is intent to make them submit through this one. He has one plan, one option. There is no plan B. His only plan is his king. Situated and installed upon Zion, his holy hill. If you've been in evening services or listening into Zephaniah, we've been talking about this. This is God's determination that His son, Jesus, the king of Israel, the baby now a man, will one day rule and reign from his chosen city, Zion, Jerusalem, Mount Zion, in the city of Jerusalem. He has determined, possessed an equal resolve as the rebels, that they would be ruled by his king. Are you equally convinced this morning, Christian, that this is God's determination? Jesus is king. Jesus will rule. Jesus will reign. There is no other option. This is destiny. Are you convinced? Do you believe this? Are you anticipating that day when Jesus will reign and subdue all of creation under his feet, prominently from Jerusalem. Do you long for that day? Do you want that day? Do you pray for that day? 
This Christmas, are you remembering that day that is coming? This is God's determination. This is a certain future. God's decree, his eternal decree, as it were, is to do this, to put Jesus there, to make him reign with all of creation subjected to him. This king's implicit power is further evidenced in his confidence in Yahweh. So you have Yahweh's confidence in him and then his confidence in Yahweh. Just notice. Yahweh claims him. This is his king. He says, my king. And then he articulates or gives the details, really what's implied in the decree that Yahweh made about him. So verse 7, I will surely tell of the decree. Now you have the words from the son himself, from the king who was spoken of, and he's going to unpack, as it were, what his father's determination concerning him is. Here is what God has said. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. This is what God has determined for the son. And this is what the son Just like the nations had a certain resolve, just like the father Yahweh has a certain resolve concerning the son, so too the son is also resolved to accomplish the father's will. He is the son. He has been begotten. He will ask and he will inherit the nations. He will possess as his property the ends of the earth, unlimited Reign, unlimited authority. Every other petty king, every other individual who has played the role of king throughout history has not had a comprehensive reign like the sun. This is unbounded authority over all things. He has been given this from his father. So he is confident in Yahweh to claim him as son, to grant him the nations, to appoint him as ruler. The father says, ask of me. I will surely, there is no doubt that he will give the nations as the inheritance of the son. All good parents leave some sort of inheritance to their children. God the father is no different. He gives an inheritance to his unique son. What is that inheritance? The nations. Where all of those rebel powers used to exist one day, they will all bow the knee to King Jesus. That will be his inheritance and obedient people everywhere. It's even reminiscent of Psalm 16. You remember there what words the the psalmist gives to Christ where Jesus says there I have set Yahweh continually before me and even in verse 5 and 6 Yahweh is the portion of my inheritance and my cup you support my lot the lines the boundaries have fallen to me in pleasant places indeed my inheritance is beautiful to me Jesus knows what's coming God has revealed to him what's coming, and he is eager for it. The nations belong to him. By right, currently, and tangibly one day. Also, thirdly, this third notable truth that we need to call to mind about the king is his divine camaraderie. His divine camaraderie. This one is equal to God. And all throughout the passage, we see what they possess in common. Just notice their camaraderie, their equality as fellow fellows, as equals, is seen in a number of ways. 
What about the common opposition that they possess? We already saw this in the first few verses. The nations rage against them. The peoples meditate on a vain thing against them. The kings of the earth take their stand against them. The rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed. So they possess a common opposition. To set, them, to set oneself against God is to set himself against Jesus. To set oneself against Jesus is to set oneself against God. You are not God's friend if you do not submit to Jesus. If you don't believe what Jesus said about himself, and if you don't bring yourself in submission to Jesus, if you convince yourself against the very words of Christ that you love God, even though you don't obey his commandments, even though you love sin, even though you don't practice repentance, even though you don't seek him in his word and have no regard for the wisdom that might come through others about what he thinks on an issue, but you have convinced yourself that you actually love God, that you're at peace with God, you are deluding yourself. That is to seek God on your own authority and not through the authority of his son, not on his own terms. They possess a common opposition. They also possess a common authority. Just notice in verse 3, whose fetters, whose cords these belong to. The fetters and the cords are equally Yahweh's and his anointed. They possess a common authority. All authority, do you remember what Jesus said? Has been given to me, has been handed over to me by my father. God's authority is Christ's authority. There is no difference. They also possess a common will, a common will. They possess a common will regarding judgment, regarding the decree, and regarding the inheritance that we spoke of. The judgment, the decree, and the inheritance they have in common. One determines the judgment, verse 5 speaks to them in his anger, terrifies them in his fury. And the son carries out the judgment. Verse 9, the father says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. One, the father gives the decree. The other carries out the decree. As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain, Yahweh says. And then that very decree is exercised, the kingship is exercised by the son. The son is the king on Zion, not the father. So they, they both are involved equally in the decree. This is the same will. And they're on the same page regarding the inheritance. One gives the inheritance, the other receives the inheritance. With no disagreement between them whatsoever. They have a common will. This divine camaraderie is also seen in that they have a common knowledge. Notice what's decreed by one is known by the other. One, the father gives the decree. And then verse seven, the son tells of it. What's only known to God, what only God knows that he's decreed is disclosed by the son. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 11 where he said, no one knows the father except the son, and no one knows, uh, the only one who knows the son is the father. So they have a common knowledge. The only one who knows the father is the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. They have a common nature, according to verse 7. That's what it means to be a son, like father, like son. So the title son means they share a common nature. This is why it was so offensive to the Jews when Jesus showed up calling himself the definite article, the son of God. They knew what this meant. They knew Psalm 2. You're saying you're equal with God. And John says that, John 5, 18. This is why they picked up stones to stone him. Not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, their version of it. But he was also calling God his father, making himself equal with God. To be the son of God is to be equal with God.
Lastly, they also possess a common homage. Just fast forward to verse 11 and 12, where the, these wise instructions are recorded. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. Just note the commands, three commands, serve, rejoice, kiss. Those are worship words. Serve Yahweh. Rejoice with fear and trembling. Kiss the son, an act of homage, an act of adoration or worship. This is what idolaters did with their idols. They would kiss the statue, literally. Or when worshiping the, the sun and the moon, heavenly bodies, they would uh, motion kisses to it as a sign of commitment and loyalty. Here, that kind of homage is owed not just to the sun, but the service is to be rendered to Yahweh. So worship belongs to them both. Everyone who claims to be a worshiper of God, yet does not worship Jesus or worships him as something less than God, is an idolater. This is false worship. They don't worship the one true God if they don't worship Jesus. They worship an idol, a figment of their own making, of their own imagination. This is a God that they have fashioned in their, in their own minds, not the true God. This divine camaraderie of the king is seen in that they are due common homage. And finally, the fourth notable truth about this king we need to remember this Christmas is his blessed protection, the blessed protection offered to us by him. This is an incredible comfort for us. Look at verse 10. So now, O kings, the same war rebels who set themselves against him come back into view. There is hope for rebels. There is hope for rebels. If you have still set yourself against God, if you are intent to not submit to him, if you love living in a way contrary to what he says is right, and you know it, Romans 1 says, you know what God's decree is and that those who don't submit are worthy of death, there's hope for you. There is still hope for you. As long as you have breath, there is hope for you. If, verse 10, you show insight, take warning, heed these words, wisely turn. Be wise, receive instruction, that's a teachable term, a term implying teachability. If you would just merely, merely do the impossible task of humbling yourself under God's authority, be teachable for once. Receive instruction, take warning, and do those three commands. Serve Yahweh with fear. Rejoice with trembling. And here is what God offers you. Last line. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. If you run to him for safety, safety from his wrath that will soon be kindled, safety from the anger that he speaks against those, verse 5, who set themselves against him. Safety from the judgment, verse 9, when he breaks all the rebels like a potter's vessel. If you flee to the sun for refuge, that one, the psalmist says, God says, is blessed. Do you know this blessing? Will you come to Christ and be saved from the wrath to come? Let me pray. God, thank you for these words. You have given us a remarkable king. 
We would not know this, King, if it were not for your grace. We would not know blessing if it were not for your grace. We do not deserve such kindness, and yet you are eager, willing, even zealous to prove your mercy to rebels like us by offering tremendous, unfathomable grace that for all of our rebellion, if we would just humble ourselves, we are richly rewarded with eternal life with infinite blessing and even life in this world with the peace and security that come from submitting to your will. I pray that any who are hearing these words who do not know you as Lord and as Savior and as Master would repent, would come to know you today, and that those of us who have fled to you have fled to your son for refuge, would rejoice, would serve you in fear and trembling. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our King. Amen.